morning, everybody. We're just going to uh, wait about 30 more seconds to a minute to just give everybody time to log on. I see a lot of people are still um, entering and joining us, so uh, we will get started very shortly. All right, Dr. Salazar, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, and good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Juan Salazar. I serve as physician-in-chief at Connecticut Children's. I'm also a professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Yukon School of Medicine. And uh, this morning, I'm going to serve as your moderator for this really wonderful session. Uh, I want to acknowledge, uh, firstly, the great partnership from three phenomenal uh, organizations, Connecticut Children's, Jackson Labs, and Yukon Health, that really have come together and put this uh, in place. But we have an ongoing, very strong partnership, which is really great for children's health. Um, we're really extremely lucky to have uh, here in our state uh, you know, these world-class institutions that are doing amazing research and really changing the lives of, of kids and, and, and adults uh, that, that suffer these rare diseases. Uh, and uh, this morning, we're going to hear from physician researchers that, uh, as you will see, are at the cutting edge of their fields and who are pursuing new cures and treatments for rare diseases. We will then hear from some individuals who are living with a rare disease, a family, because we recognize the Patient voice is so critical and integral as part of this conversation. So really uh, extremely thankful with, with John and Susan who, who have joined us. Uh, lastly, we will hear from a representative from the uh, National Organization for Rare Disorders. That's also known to, to ma many of you know it as NORD, who will share some helpful information and resources for families and patients with rare diseases. Now, some housekeeping items, as always important as part of these webinars, we, we will be reserving approximately five minutes at the tail end of each of our discussions for Q&A from the audience. Uh, please, uh, as you probably all know this, but go ahead and utilize the Q&A button at the bottom and uh, so that we, we will read your questions. And now, so with that, let me uh, introduce our, our panelists. Uh, again, we have, uh, uh, you know, just really, uh, you know, three uh, uh, amazing individuals. Uh, you know, the, the first one, uh, Dr. Uh, Jewel Aksadi, Dr. Ching Lao, and Dr. Rebecca Reba Wellman. And at the end, we'll introduce Dr. Jermaine Lee. Uh, so I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce uh, themselves and uh, explain uh, a little bit about their research. And uh, we will begin with, uh, uh, with the first one. Uh, these are, you know, they look very sharp in these pictures. They're all smiling, which is wonderful. And so we will begin uh, with uh, the, the first one will be Dr. Uh, Lau, uh, again, who uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lau to uh, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm a pediatric oncologist, so I take care of uh, children with cancers. And um, because all cancers are rare diseases uh, by definition, either you use the US definition or the, uh, the uh, European definition, uh, because the incidence of pediatric cancer is low as opposed to uh, adult cancer. So my research is basically trying to um, utilize uh, genomic technologies to try to uh, improve the outcome of uh, children with cancers. And uh, because we, we have very few cases uh, in each country, uh, the ultimate thing for us to do basically is to develop a global collaboration in better uh, finding better ways to diagnose these cancers and also better treatment. So that's what I do. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And, and uh, the, uh, Dr. Aksadi, uh, same question for you. 
Hi, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I'm a pediatric neurologist and a neuromuscular specialist. And what I've been witnessing in the last 10 years is, is amazing. It is exciting to be a, a, a doctor because we are having now um, uh, possibilities to treat children with numerous of these rare neurological disorders. And it really makes a, a big change. Uh, we are seeing uh, improvements and not uh, decline in these devastating diseases. A clear example that I wanna show is spinal muscular atrophy on my next slide. And this uh, disease was devastating, was uh, causing the uh, most death in a genetic disorder in neurological um, um, in babies who mainly died within the first few years of life. Next slide shows now uh, since 19, uh, 2016, we have been able to provide uh, new treatments, uh, even three forms of treatments that is uh, significantly uh, improved uh, the life of the patient and prevented the death of these patients. Next slide, please. Um, so these patients now with the new treatments, they don't die anymore. They in, in fact, uh, in uh, developing, they are reaching milestones when treated early and they are able to achieve quality of life, uh, which, is, uh, which is amazing uh, uh, now. Uh, the most important is to, uh, next slide please, to diagnose these patients. Uh, uh, so this was my life like, I guess. I wanna mention that the most important and the challenging is to recognize these diseases early so we can treat them early the earlier the treatment, the better. So newborn screening became a really game changer in this field. And we are happy to see that patients who are uh, treated at newborn stage, they are achieving um, basically normal uh, development and uh, health. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aksadi. Really, truly transformational and really appreciate it. We'll hear a little bit more about this in just a minute. And, uh, and now, Dr. Reba Wellman, if you can please tell us a little bit about yourself and your research. Hi, my name is Rebecca Reba Woolman. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist here at Connecticut Children's and affiliated most of my research is at UConn Health. Um, so the disorders that I focus on are glycogen storage disease, which are disorders that individuals have trouble mobilizing sugar throughout their body. That sounds somewhat simple, but it's a, it's a devastating illness where somebody's unable to keep their blood sugar up more than three to four hours. And this puts them at risk for severe low blood sugar seizures. Um, and potentially death. This was a universally fatal disease even in the early 70s. So that now with some of the earlier uh, advances, which was use of cornstarch to try and improve the safety um, for these individuals throughout the day, that was where it stopped until recently. And much like Dr. Akshadi's work, um, the last few years have been incredibly exciting. So my group works with a number of different companies, and there's currently three sponsors that are focusing on gene therapy or mRNA therapy to significantly benefit patients' lives. Um, these outcomes, if you go to the next slide, allow us to treat the liver, and if you advance once and then twice, um, allow us to treat the liver where the where sugar is stored in the body and release sugar to the rest. We now have patients who are able, who couldn't fast for an hour or two, able to fast through the night. Cornstarch, which used to have to be given three to four hours in the current study that's being done with gene therapy um, has been had an average reduction of 70%. So the goal of our work is to help um, investigate and bring these drugs to potentially market if there's significant benefits to help both the day-to-day -day, um, as well as the long-term health impacts of a disease that has both chronic and acute concerns. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reba Wellman. Really fascinating and I'm well aware of your, your gene therapy that is ongoing currently as we speak and uh, has really changed the lives of, uh, of, of people with glycogen storage disease. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Aksadi mentioned gene therapy for another uh, life-threatening disease and changing the therapies and, and, and Dr. Lau and the cancer therapy. So really great advances uh, under no, this is not no longer science fiction, this is real, which is really remarkable. So uh, question number two uh, for each one of you. Uh, so rare disease research can be life changing and life saving. We just heard about uh, uh, several examples. And for those living with rare diseases, it's, really, it's, a, it, it's, it's a tremendous problem. And for parents of these children, 
Uh, but sometimes this type of research can also benefit the general population and uh, more common ailments. Are there ways in which your research has broader applicability beyond the rare disease population? I think that's really, really important. And we'll start with Dr. Reba Wallman. You can go first. Sure, thank you. So definitely, I'd say some of the understanding, some of the um, new areas that we've learned about, we anticipated, which is this is a blood sugar disorder. And although glycogen storage disease type 1A, which is the current focus, it's only one in 100,000, there's a number of other low blood sugar disorders and high blood sugar disorders like diabetes, which is not a rare disease. And so some of the mechanisms that we're learning about have implications for all of that. I'll say some of the, the work that we didn't expect to have um, effects on are other parts of the endocrine, other parts of the hormone system, including how steroids are impacted by low blood sugar in this disorder, as well as insulin. So this has potential implications far beyond a rare disorder called glycogen storage disease. Thank you, Dr. Rivo. And uh, Dr. Aksari, the same question to you. Yes. Um... Um, these the therapies, even though they are hugely expensive, but now approved and available, and certainly they're challenging for families to make sure that uh, they can get access to these therapies and uh, we don't get uh, hurdles from uh, insurance setbacks. And the, we learned during the process of treating these disorders, we have learned a lot of um, uh, standard treatments for other disorders, which can be applicable for um, other uh, muscle nerve disorders in, in and uh, cerebral palsy, for example. And we are expecting more and more of these treatments bec uh, becoming available, making a large impact for larger patient population. Thank you, Dr. Asadi. Dr. Lau, same question. Yeah, because we uh, make use of genomic technologies to um, develop uh, novel diagnostics as well as uh, treatment, uh, the lessons we learn from these um, uh, type of research can be applicable for any kind of uh, human disease, basically. So for example, we uh, first thing to do in uh, understanding a pediatric cancer is to uh, find out what genetic changes that these uh, cancer cells have acquired uh, during the development of the cancer. So we basically do DNA sequencing of the entire genome of the, um, of the cancer cells. And it's easier said than done because the analysis of uh, these um, uh, data uh, took us a while because there are a lot of uh, noise, so-called noise in the data that prevent us from getting directly to the answers that we are looking for. But with uh, collaborative efforts throughout the world, we have now come to a point where we can easily uh, sequence the entire genome and come up with the analysis uh, results within a few weeks uh, with fairly accurate uh, results, I, I have to say. Uh, so by that, we, we can now uh, pinpoint where the uh, genetic abnormalities are in uh, each of the uh, pediatric cancers. And same technology can be applied to study other human diseases. And the other technologies that we um, utilize is what we call the in silico uh, drug screening. Because a lot of these rare diseases, we don't even know where to start you know, to um, provide treatment for the patients. So again, we go back to our genomics data. And once we have identified a genetic abnormality, the next thing we do is to say, okay, how does this genetic abnormality impact the protein that is responsible for carrying out the function in the cell? And once we know which protein to target, we collaborate with other um, researchers to figure out the three-dimensional structure of that protein. And instead of doing many, many experiments in the lab, we basically take that uh, structural data of the protein and use it to screen several million chemical structures and ask the computer algorithm, is there any chemical structure that, that could potentially modulate the activity of this protein? So that can be done in now a few months time to screen, let's say five to seven million compounds. And so using that kind of 
uh, uh, strategy, we can now get to at least what potential compounds would work for our type of disease very, very quickly. So again, this can be applied to study uh, any kind of human diseases, especially if there's a genetic uh, component to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the three of you. I'm going to move on to the Q&A session because we're running a little bit out of time in this section. So I'm so the the uh, Q&A is open for for any of the participants to ask uh, from questions from Dr. Reba Wallman, Dr. Aksadi, and Dr. Lau. And while uh, while a, ch a question is asked, uh, uh, my my own question for for each one of you, and briefly, if you can respond, how does federal funding uh, or or the difficulty of obtaining federal funding either help you or not help you with the research? And uh, I'll begin with Dr. Aksadi. Um, federal and uh, um, other um, uh, fundings uh, have been crucial to develop these conditions. I've been not only a clinician, but a researcher for the last uh, 20, 25 years. And um, my research was only possible with, with funding from um, not only the National Institute of Health, but also from patient organizations. And patient organizations can be also very critical for obtaining this. Without funding, I think the field would have been stalled uh, completely. And so it, it is very important. And uh, I'm very happy to see that NIH recognized the uh, rare disorders as a, as a key topic. Yeah, and Dr. Reva Wallman, sort of the similar question. I mean, the, you know, GSD is a rare disease. So why would the NIH, uh, you know, spend money in a disease that's rare? And I'm being facetious with that question. So what I'd say is to understand the building blocks you highlighted with the prior question that these rare diseases give us insight into the far greater understanding of how the body works. And so that the, the funding for rare disease has implications far beyond. In addition, that these are such devastating disorders that with understanding those building blocks, you can have significant benefits. Again, I, I get to be at the point where some companies have become involved in drug development. None of that would have been possible without original understanding and support um, from the NIH funding. Dr. Lau, just briefly, 30 seconds to answer that question. Yeah, in the past, it's very challenging to get funding to support pediatric cancer research, simply because the impact as calculated by numbers is much lower when you compare with adult cancers. But thanks to the tireless effort of many uh, pediatric cancer advocacy groups, things have changed drastically. There is now a law in, uh, in the US called the Race for Kids uh, Law that requires pharmaceutical company to develop a, 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 a treatment for pediatric cancer if the pediatric cancer shares a common target as the adult cancer. So there's no excuse for them not to work with us because they, they, don't, they don't see it as a market to help us develop a drug for 500 kids with a certain type of cancer. But things have changed drastically now. Well, with, with, with each one of you and so passionate about what you do, you certainly convince me and convince others. So thank you for, for what you have done. So we're gonna move on now to the, to the second part of our session. And uh, for this one, we, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Emily Germain Lee, uh, who I had the pleasure of uh, luring away from Johns Hopkins uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, somehow I managed to convince her, but she's, I think she's very happy here in Connecticut. She's a professor of pediatrics, um, a professor of reconstructive sciences, and she's chief of our division of pediatric endocrinology and diabetes, uh, which she's managed to keep us in the, in the top 50 in the nation as a, a fantastic division. Uh, she's also the director for the Center for Rare Bone Disorders, uh, and uh, she's a member of the Jackson Lab as well, and, and it's a formidable researcher. Uh, is the only person that I know, in addition to her husband, who's actually sent mice into space. And so that, you know, that's, uh, uh, and, and I, I try to convince her to name one of the mice after me, but she decided not to do that. So that's probably a good thing. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to hear directly also from a, from a patient and family who has been impacted by rare disease. And uh, it, I think it's critical that uh, by um, amplifying voices such as, you know, part of the conversation is gonna be really, really important. And we have members, we, we have the Dallas Center family joining us today. So thank you so much to them for being part of 
John and Susan, who are here and I think in their home, I believe, and, and joining us. So thank you for for joining us. And we uh, and we have several questions. So let, I'm going to uh, Emily, if you if you want to open up, uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm passing this on to you. Thank you, Dr. Salazar. Um, so the focus of my work for the past 25 years has been on rare bone disorders, both in my clinic and in my lab, where I work on mouse models of certain rare bone diseases with the goal of finding new treatments. And one rare condition that I work on is osteogenesis imperfecta, also called OI. Um, you may know it as brittle bone disease. And believe it or not, there are some children with OI who've had dozens of fractures by the time they enter grade school. And we all know when bones break, you lose mobility. And when you're not moving, your muscles get weak. So if you have bone disease, you end up with weak muscles. And when you think about it, in muscle disorders, for example, patients are often not mobile and are wheelchair bound, and they end up having weakened bones since you need to be mobile in order to maintain bone strength. So you can see bones and muscles are very intertwined. And when one is affected, so is the other. And my collaborator, Dr. Sajin Lee, from the Jackson Laboratory in Yukon Health works on muscle. And so together, we've been investigating a therapeutic strategy to help both bone and muscle at the same time. And specifically, we've been working with an experimental drug that he created that targets the pathway of a gene that controls muscle growth. And we've shown that this drug can increase both bone density and muscle mass if we inject it into mice. And in fact, we showed that this drug works in my mice with OI that have brittle bones. So in a collaboration between the Jackson Laboratory, Yukon Health and Connecticut Children's, we tested whether this experimental drug could be effective during space flight by sending mice up to the International Space Station. Because when there's no gravity, bones and muscles waste away at a really dramatic rate. So it's an ideal place really to test the drug's effect. And as you may know, bone loss and muscle loss are major health issues for astronauts in space. Uh, in fact, they have to exercise two to three hours a day in space just to counteract this. So basically we wanted to see if our experimental drug when injected into the mice could prevent both bone and muscle loss when in space. And indeed we were able to show that the drug worked. So overall, we think that this has implications not only for astronauts during space travel, but clearly also for people on earth who are suffering from bone and muscle loss as a result of disuse such as the patients I see in clinic with bone diseases that lead to decreased mobility from fractures and then to muscle weakness, such as an OI, or even for anyone with a chronic disease who's bedridden and in whom bones and muscles are deteriorating. So this is a perfect point at which to transition to Mr. John D'Alessandro and his wife, Susan. Mr. D'Alessandro has OI, as does his son, and they see me as well as Dr. Nancy Dunbar in the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Center at Connecticut Children's. The D'Alessandro family has advocated with me in the past at the State Legislative Office for Rare Disease Day, and I'm really truly honored to have them here today. Welcome. Thank you for having uh, us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Germain Lee. Uh, my name is John and I'm a 61 year old male. And uh, I was born outside of this country and my diagnosis wasn't early on. Uh, I, I came from literally uh, a town where we didn't have medical attention. We didn't have uh, doctors or hospitals. Well, the closest thing we had was a midwife. And being that, uh, we never even knew that this condition even existed until I came here. At the age of 40, I was uh, diagnosed with osteogenesis imperfecta. And again, it was one of those things where it was accidentally discovered in me because of my fracture. Uh, during my lifetime, I would fracture quite often, but when I was 40, I, I fractured quite simply as a trip and fall. And my fractures were so severe that the attendant doctor did a little bit of uh, investigating and he diagnosed me with OI, just through my no normal characteristics. And uh, 
at the time I was married and my wife was pregnant with our first child. And during that time, we did not know if it was hereditary or not. So through genetic testing, we did find out that my son has type one OI as I do. And uh, during that time, my wife was a major, a major part of our, you know, research and just getting down to it, you know. So I think that that's when it kind of shifted for me because we didn't know much about it. We worked with the doctors at UConn and the doctors at CCMC, and we found more information. Um, I feel like I kind of played a dual role support for John because there are a lot of things that go along with having a chronic disease like this. John needed to stop working. He is a cabinet maker by trade. Over time, um, his body just couldn't handle that kind of work anymore. For Christian, it was a little bit different because, um, you know, my job for him was to be his protector with brittle bone disease. You know, when you're a three-year-old, every situation you walk into, you you analyze birthday parties and school and making sure every situation was safe for him. Um, it's been a blessing to have CCMC right now. We are, it is not lost on us how fortunate we are that CCMC is, you know, steps from our doorway. Um, bringing Dr. Jermaine Lee here has been a blessing. We go for infusions. John um, goes with Christian for infusions at the CCMC Infusion Center. Um, and we're just amazed at the families we meet who travel from all over the country to come here for their care. We've become friendly with a family in Texas who travels all this way to get their care here. And that speaks volumes to the quality of the care that we're receiving here. I was on a Facebook page last night for OI parents, and there is a dad in California who had a a son born last week with a spontaneous mutation of OI and he's looking into moving to Connecticut. And I thought that was amazing because he wanted to be here because he's heard such wonderful things. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John and Susan. I mean, that's, that's just uh, remarkable. And, and thank you, Emily, for, for sharing, uh, uh, you, you know, your work and your passion. One of the reasons we, we brought you here is because you wanted to bring your, you know, your expertise and, and the care for families uh, such as John and Susan's uh, in, in a way that we can do it here in partnership with the university, with Jackson Labs and Connecticut Children's, which allows this to happen. Um, so, so John and Susan, I, I have two, two questions for you, and you've already answered the one I was going to ask first, which was, you know, tell us about yourself. So you already did that. I see that you're not shy about it, so I appreciate it. Uh, the, the, the second question is, uh, it, which you alluded to it a little bit, I mean, but tell us, uh, John and, and Susan, we'll be giving you, John, what does it mean to have uh, the expertise here locally uh, with, with Dr. Jermaine Lee and the Bone Center and Connecticut Children's and UConn and Jax? Tell us about that. To me, having Dr. Jermaine Lee and the Infusion Center literally steps from my home has been literally a godsend. Because with my condition, my biggest... Uh, my biggest complaint is chronic pain. I mean, I'm not a football player. I don't play soccer, so I could stay away from the fractures, but the day in and day out is the chronic pain that goes with my condition. And just having that kind of research, that kind of personnel behind this has been a godsend. I can't, I can't say, enough good things about it. And if I can just mention also before when they would receive infusions, we would go to the hospital and it was a full day. I mean, we were, we were in for at least 12 hours because we were on a floor and there were critical things happening and we had to wait for pharmacy to prepare meds. And it was just, it felt like an ordeal. It felt awful. It felt one more way that our family was different and Krishna had to be away from school and it just was not something we look forward to. Now with the new infusion center, it's so efficient and it's so tailored to our needs that we're able to get in and get out and Christian can go back to school, although we don't usually make him do that. Um, but it's just been, it's just been a burden that's been lifted off of us. 
And if you could imagine having a 61 year old man sitting next to a group of children, you know, I, I, I feel good about that too. Keeps I, me young. Keeps me young. Absolutely. For somebody who's turning 60 this year, that uh, thank you. You give me a lot of hope and resilience. So thank you very much for that. Uh, John, uh, it, it occurs to me that, uh, I mean, I'm just listening to you and your wife and, uh, and to share, you know, something about your, yourself, which is so personal, you know, it, uh, having a disease and uh, what, what gives you that courage? I mean, you, I, I'm just so impressed by your ability to communicate and, and share everything that has happened. Uh, tell us a little bit about that journey. In plain, in a simple word, whatever I can do to, uh, to, for the research part of it, for the future generations, this is why I'm doing it. We're like thinking I, about our grandchildren already who, you know, who may be at risk for developing a lie. And we have seen the longevity of John having no treatment to the great treatment Christians had. And we can imagine that our grandchildren, should they have OI, would be much safer and healthier. And that's the only reason why I do it. it at this point, there might be a treatment, but who knows? With further research, there could be a cure. I, I, absolutely. I think that is, uh, you know, the hopes and, you know, just by looking at our panelists today and their, and their lifetimes, what they have seen, and how things have changed for each of their patients is just really re remarkable. Uh, we, we do have time for questions from the audience. So, uh, you know, please uh, uh, go ahead and type your question in the Q&A session. I, I know there, there, there have to be plenty of, of questions for, uh, for, for John and Susan or Dr. Jermaine Lee uh, to tell us a little bit. Uh, John and Susan, the other, I guess the, the other question I would have is, uh, is you know, how is, how is Christian dealing with all of this? And uh, obviously with parents like you who, have, have so much energy is superb, but uh, tell us a little bit about the, you know, his journey and, and how the, this community can help in that process. I think that it's getting a little easier for him as he's getting older, to be honest. Certainly when he was younger, um, he felt much more different than he does now. And that's not to say he doesn't have challenges now, um, I guess maybe I wish I had had more resources available to me when he was younger to know, um, not in terms of medical treatment, but more for support in terms of the emotionality of it all. Um, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, just growing up and he would say, dad, uh, can we go play football outside? And to me, that was an emotional drain. Uh, it was emotionally draining because having a father or OI, he did not quite understand why, you know, we couldn't go outside and play soccer or, or some sort of, you know, sports. As he's gotten older, he's kind of found his own niche. He's into singing in school now. He's into the drama department at school. So it was a struggle for him when he was little. He wasn't an athlete and that's where a lot of kids that age are focused. Um, but it seems to be getting better as he's it, getting older. It is getting better as being a teenager. Yeah. I guess for Dr. Jermaine Lee to uh, sort of piggyback onto that, and as you in your with your researcher at clinician had, um, what message uh, will you have for other families like John and Susan and, and Christian in terms of the future of therapy for OI and other rare bone diseases? Well, um, I've just been amazed at what I've seen happen over my career, you know, just over the past 25, 30 years, there's certain rare bone disorders specifically, I'll, you know, I can point to that um, one like um, hypophosphatasia that uh, an infant born with that, it was basically uh, knowing that they would die very soon. It, it was incredibly draining, you know, as a physician, overwhelmingly traumatic for families. And now those children live and they're active and they walk and they go to school and you would never know. And I honestly didn't think I'd see that happen. Um, and it's happened for so many conditions. The rare disease world has just blossomed and opened up as everyone on the panel mentioned, the you know treatments that are going to be cures 
um, or you know, at least life changing. And for OI, I've seen dramatic changes um, with really you know newer and newer drugs. And I'm hoping with what what I've been working on with my collaborators that that can lead to something in the future and that I get to see that. But I think it's just been just overwhelmingly transformational, especially the past five years. And I look to the future with just so much hope um, that, um, you know, uh, I just honestly, when I started in this field, I uh, was just hoping for little increments. And I saw, I've seen huge giant steps. So uh, let me back back to John and Susan and and you know all of this is requires money to be able to do the the research the work it's it's expensive because of the therapies so we may have a couple of uh, you know some state legislatures or federal le legislation board in this panel what would you want to tell them that you know in terms of what's needed uh, from your perspective as parents from my perspective like I said. Uh, at my age, I don't want to say it's a little bit too little or too late, but just as far as uh, the research goes, money towards research, that way our future generations won't have to do the suffering. As a part of myself, my biggest concern would be uh, like, like I, I go through chronic pain every day. And during the opioid crisis, I feel that door has completely shut on me. In a way, I'm glad for that. But being in the family, like we have a family where I have OI, my son has OI, and my wife, she's with us because she's she has uh, MS. And just having resources to help us out in an emotional way or you know, and money that, too. I know a, a strain that I feel is, um, you know, I do have MS. I need to continue working because I carry the health insurance for our family. Um, so I just, I don't, I don't know how funding can be used to help people with rare disease, but that is definitely a worry that I have that I know other people in our community have as well. Um, I'm, I mean, I was forced to retire at a young age where I left my career literally kicking and screaming because I loved my job so much. But here we are, it, it, it's, it's financially draining. And yeah. we feel that we're in a position where uh, we have three different uh, conditions under one roof. And we just feel the resources aren't there too, too, you know, too much. Thank you, uh, John and Susan. Thank you for sharing your your story. And, and Emily, thank you for your leadership and helping with rare bone diseases. I think we're I think the future is much brighter. So that's that's the good news. And and it appears to be that the federal government has heard because they're they're really focusing on this at the NIH level, which is really really important. Um, and so it's ten ten. We have to move on to the panel number three. And uh, this one. Uh, we're going to, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Alicia Lawrence to you all. Alicia is a patient services case manager for NORD, otherwise known as the National Organization for Rare Diseases, Rare Disorders, I'm sorry. Uh, and we know that we have uh, uh, patient families that are tuning in this morning who may have questions about how to navigate the array of services uh, that NORD uh, offers. And and we uh, so, so the... Uh, I'm going to ask him to pass it on to uh, Alicia, who's who's here, and I really appreciate you joining us. I love the the background with the uh, with the zebra, and I know that that's very meaningful, of course, in in terms of rare diseases, and and the heart obviously is critically important as part of all that we do. So, Alicia, passing it on to you. Hello, thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, you know, just a little bit about Nord. Um, next slide, please. Nord is. Um, a patient advocacy or organization dedicated to all individuals with rare diseases and the organizations that serve them. Um, NORD is a national organization and one of our offices is headquartered right here in Danbury. Uh, we're, we've existed for nearly four decades as the hub of rare disease community, leading efforts to connect patients and patient organizations with other stakeholders and driving progress for all. 
Um, in the late 1970s and early 80s, patients and families living with rare diseases felt alone and forgotten. At that time, there was very little being done to study rare diseases and develop treatments. And so leaders of several rare disease patient organizations formed a hot coalition, which was instrumental in passing the Orphan Drug Act of 1983, which created financial incentives for the development of treatments for rare diseases. Um, next slide, please. For many patients with rare diseases, NORD is the first organization um, contacted for support. Recognizing this need in the rare disease community, NORD's Information and Resource Services Department was developed. Um, usually when I work with uh, patients, to start, I always recommend that they go to our patient, they access our website um, as we have a NORD's Rare Disease Database, which is a high level look at rare diseases, their symptoms and expert organizations, organizations and so much information for the undiagnosed or recently diagnosed who um, are on this journey. Um, our website is a treasure show of resources, patient stories, and engagement opportunities. But with only a few minutes, I just wanna focus on um, NORD's programs today. Uh, so to start, I work with the patient services department and we are a full operating phone bank connecting directly with patients and families in need. Last year, we were able to answer 60,000 calls and over 50,000 emails. And when people call in, it's usually about financial burdens of their diseases, just like John and Susan were talking about, their diagnostic odyssey, household expenses, utility costs, uh, traveling out of state to receive treatment, as well as the need for copay assistance. Um, these are really big barriers to care and access for patients across the country. But there are a lot of resources to help. Um, we do have a patient assistance program that offers support to patients from educational tools to medical funding to non-medical funding. And we also have what we call a caregiver respite program. And in 2021, last year, we were able to help over 300 families um, with assistance. We also provide assistance with laboratory, diagnostic testing, physical and occupational therapy, durable medical equipment, and again, travel to medical appointments. Uh, I'm proud to say that we provided support to over 9,000 patients, totaling over $40 million last year. And we help patients in the US as well as the territories. Uh, when patients and caregivers reach out and they're seeking assistance and we don't have a program, that's when I come in as the information and resource of services um, to help find potential resources for those um, rare disorders that we do not have patient assistance for. We also have a, a research team that gives hope to rare disease patients and families. They work with patient advocacy organizations through which we provide grants that have resulted in numerous published advances and at least two FDA approved therapies. Um, we also have work with patient organizations as far as disease specific registries to support research through the natural history studies. We have an I am rare registry, rare launch, and um, also we work with clinical, clinicaltrials.gov. Again, we have our rare disease reports, GARD's website, which is also something we encourage patients and families to do, as well as genetic counseling. Um, next slide, please. NORD is a partner for patients at every step of the rare disease journey. At NORD, our motto is, alone we are rare, but together we are strong. And it is the core of all of our services. Again, NORD supports rare disease patients, families, and medical professionals through several key incentives, such as patient, patient assistance, advocacy, and regulatory affairs. We have education, mentorship for patient organization, as well as research support. Our advocacy and policy team work with um, lawmakers on Capitol Hill and the White House and government agencies, all the way down to the local level to help inform policies that are reflected to the needs of the rare disease patients. If advocacy and policy, policy is what you strive for, we also have part of the organization called the Rare Action Network, 
And you can visit that at rareaction.org. We have over 15,000 advocates across the country in our Rare Action Network who fight for regulatory and policy changes to best support rare disease families in every state. And last week, we launched the latest edition of our annual state report card, which rates all 50 states on performance of rare diseases such as newborn screening, Medicaid eligibility, prescription drug out-of-pocket costs, and protections. So, you know, if, if you'd like, you can check out Connecticut's uh, profile and see how, as a state, they're, what they're doing for the rare disease community. Um, last slide. This is why Rare Disease Day is so important. Community support and advocacy for testing, treatment, and coverage will all advance the overall care for our rare disease patients. We must continue to create awareness of rare disorders. All of you are working to support rare disease patients should, should look to NORD as a partner and resource on the journey, living healthier, safer, and stronger. And uh, thank you guys for your time and any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Alicia, and uh, really amazing work. Uh, and, and to be highlighted, of course, today on this very important day, I, I, did not, I could not think of any, anything more important. So thank you. Thank you for what you do and you're the organization. Uh, we do have a uh, we do have a question uh, very specific from one of our attendees. Maybe Dr. Aksadi can comment, and then maybe Nord can also. And the question is about hydranencephaly and porencephaly uh, as a rare disease. So, Dr. Aksadi, are there any any services for children with hydranencephaly or porencephaly? Um, certainly, with the collaboration of neurosurgical department, uh, we take care of patients with uh, these conditions. I think the future question comes up recognizing these uh, conditions intrauterine. And uh, uh, few, uh, uh, there are a lot of developments of fetal surgery, um, um, helping these uh, children with, uh, um, uh, with even before they born, uh, so their brain can develop uh, uh, better. Certainly the uh, hydrencephaly is a very serious condition and um, uh, likely related to some genetic abnormalities. Unfortunately, we have to recognize there are some conditions there that they are, um, uh, uh, they have very little chance to um, um, repair, but uh, I think that a lot of work uh, is done, being done for interprotential um, uh, treatments. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I guess the question for, for, for all of you, and. You know, we um, here at Connecticut Children's, we are in our strategic plan for the next five years, and one of the 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 most important pieces of the of that strategic plan is the creation of a fetal medicine center. Uh, we're working with a with a fetal surgeon who's uh, going to be coming our way in our new tower, and it's going to be critical to diagnose and institute therapies uh, before children are born, which actually will prevent some of the complications, and so. So uh, I guess comments from uh, from any of you, from uh, Emily about rare diseases and Julia, uh, with, with the future for rare diseases in terms of earlier diagnosis in utero with potential surgical therapeutic options for the for the fetus, how, how does that look to, to you in the future? Emily, I'll start with you and then Julia. Well, um, that's really key. It's gonna be transformational. Um, one aspect is, uh, the diagnostic capabilities will be so much greater, but um, what could be done um, is, you know, I think is open to, to so many avenues, one of which would be very early treatment, perhaps in utero. And then as you said, Dr. Salazar, er, early surgical correction um, for a lot of the skeletal dysplasias and rare bone disorders, both of those things would come into play. So. I think that as that starts and, and it builds, especially at Connecticut Children's, ramifications of that are gonna be just overwhelming. Thank you. Dr. Aksadi, just brief response to that. Yes, uh, certainly the, some of the conditions we treat now like spinal muscle atrophy, there's a, a severe form that uh, the disease starts uh, even in intrauterine stage. And I think the expansion of the treatment uh, uh, in, in uh, while um, 
the child before the child is born, I think it brings up opportunities to early um, uh, treatment and uh, prevention of uh, further disability. Great, thank you. Uh, this is more of a, I, I, I deal with this all the time as a researcher. I think I'm a better clinician because I understand and, and vice versa. So a brief remarks, uh, Dr. Lau, if you know, you're, you're a world-renowned researcher and oncologist, how has research helped you be a better physician than uh, at least treating these rare disorders? Dr. Lau? Sorry, slow to uh, unmute. <laughs> Uh, definitely it helps uh, because when we start thinking about the uh, problems that we need to address in the laboratory, a lot of times we have to go back and uh, reorganize a lot of the uh, information that has previously been gathered because if we don't learn from the past, we're not going to move forward. So by reviewing these uh, uh existing data, it actually helps us find patterns that we previously uh, missed. And so when a new patient shows up that somehow fits that pattern that we now newly recognize, it helped us narrow down the differential possibility, uh, uh, diagnosis possibilities, and actually can move the uh, final diagnostic uh, uh, workup faster. So I think that's an immediate uh, positive impact that research has in our patient care. Searching. And uh, Dr. Reba Wallman, I guess the sort of, I'm going to maybe modify the question a little bit. And, you know, with, with I'm always impressed with uh, how families and with children and themselves that have rare diseases are willing to, uh, you know, put themselves up front with innovative therapies that may not, be, we don't know, you know, if they're going to turn out to be good or not, or, uh, or they're going to have side effects. Tell me a little bit about you know, your, your experience with some of the families that you've treated for glycogen storage disease and that they're involved in these phase one trials, first ever, right, kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot that goes into that, and I think it bridges both the clinical and research. Um, I feel very lucky to, to work with a population that is so motivated. We talked a little bit about patient advocacy. There's a lot of patients and families who advocate who have been very vocal um, in the disorders that I treat and research. I would say some of this comes from that I think every patient with rare disease experiences almost a fear of medicine, a fear of interacting with people who don't know what you have, that don't know how to treat you, and really searching out those experts that do know, as, as Mr. and Mrs. D'Alessandro commented, like families who travel all over the country to join a center where they're known. And so I think that speaks to it in part, because I work with a population who's very fearful of medicine, given their own personal experiences and walking into emergency rooms where people don't, have never even heard of their disease. So for them to try and improve that experience for future generations, whether it's their own children or others, they are incredibly driven. One, to get information out there as to what their disorder is, and two, to really participate in some groundbreaking trials, as you said, Dr. Salazar, that phase one trials, we don't entirely know. We have animal models, but to be first in human, that takes a lot of drive and bravery um, and dedication on the patient part. And so I think a lot of their own personal experiences um, drive that. And, um, and it really is, I feel very lucky to work with such a driven population who has the greater goal um, to help others with their same situation. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, I think John and Susan, uh... I have, I'm not sure if Susan or John raised a hand. I think maybe Susan. So it, you know, last remarks and then we have to close. Last, I just Susan. wanted to piggyback on that. I remember when it was time to start Christian on Pemidronate, we didn't know if we were doing the right thing. We, we, we just were going on what we were being told. But I remember John saying to me, I'm in pain every day and I don't want to look at him when he's 50 and say, you know, I could have given you this medicine when you were younger, but I didn't. And so that was really a catalyst for us to move forward with the treatment that was being offered to him. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, there, there is a question in the chat, which I'm gonna, we'll probably, we'll, we'll respond this offline is about uh, 
intellectual developmental disorder, autosomal recessive 68. So we'll we'll make sure we get back to you with a specific uh, response to your question. So I'm looking at the clock. It's 1027. I think we're due till 1030. And so I, I, I want to say thank you to Connecticut Children's, to Jax and Yukon Health for you know, coming together today to organize this really, really hugely important program. I think just to know that the three organizations are working very closely to make sure that we provide the, the best service, best diagnosis, best research that advances care for children and adults with rare diseases. Um, I also want to thank my, my panelists uh, and colleagues, uh, Dr. Aksadi, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Jermaine Lee, really appreciate you and your, 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 your mighty mice. Uh, to Dr. Reba Wellman and all the work that she does with, with patients, uh, and, uh, and, and Dr. Lau, of course, with, with you know his innovation. And Alicia, thank you for sharing the work that Nord is doing on behalf of everyone else. And of course, the rest of the faces here that you see, uh, you know, Lisa, Christy, Marie, uh, Emily, who's, in, who's not, you can't see her in the camera, uh, Rohan and, uh, and others, and Jane Bird, who you're not seeing right now, who really helped to organize this. I could not be more grateful with all of you. This, I believe this is recorded, so it will be available for people to log in. So share this with families and other people who may want to see it. Um, and just, you know, last word is uh, research changed lives. Uh, it, it really has made a huge impact for families. It's made a huge impact in the COVID era. You know, very, very important. Uh, if without that, I think we would be in much, in much more serious trouble than, than we were, even though this lasted for two years. Uh, so again, thank you to all of you. Have a, a, a wonderful day and thank you for everything that you do. And we'll connect again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.